I normally say good evening, ladies and gentlemen, but in these days of gender politics, welcome one and all. <laughs> Which is safe, I think. There's some people who regard themselves as plural. <coughs> they born in Middlesex, you see. <laughs> Tonight's speaker is David um, McDonough. The topic is Adam Smith and... Uh, Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, as a manifesto of pristine liberalism. And why not? Well, oh, sorry, sorry, please, David. Uh, well, Murray Rothbard, uh, in, uh, who was a great propagandist and good economist, uh, set out a sort of explosion uh, by, uh, by, uh, in his history of uh, economic thought by saying Smith was not up to much as an economist and not to much as a liberal and so on. And uh, I thought at the time, well, strangely, he was a pretty good liberal propagandist Smith as well, although this is obfuscated by uh, the fact that he's been so successful that we now take him for granted. Um, so um, this is partly the reason which uh, initiated this, but then having a look at Rothbard's scholarship, uh, we see where he got the thing from, and it, it did come from another explosion earlier on. Uh, uh, the Austrian economist uh, Joseph Schumpeter uh, wrote a long, detailed history of economic thought, well over a thousand pages, and it was published by his wife Elizabeth after he died in about 1952, I think. And uh, this also uh, gave exactly the same sort of explosion. You know, Smith isn't up to much as an economist, and he wasn't much of a liberal either. <laughs> and uh, and so, uh, uh, but that is the story doesn't end there, you see, uh, because. Uh, where did Schumpeter get this from? Was it his original scholarship? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm afraid. Schumpeter, before the First World War, went to the London School of Economics, just not too far from here, and uh, attended the lectures of a man called Edwin Cannon, who happens to be even known to this day. I mean, if you have a look at, and you want the definitive or the most wonderful or popular uh, edition of the Wealth of Nations, it will be Cannon's edition, Edwin Cannon's edition. Because Cannon is, it was in his lifetime and probably is, remains probably the best Adam Smith scholar ever. But Cannon himself was a, a much younger man than Smith, of course. <laughs> in fact, he was born well after Smith. And uh, as uh, Cannon was a young man, socialism was coming into fashion and liberalism was going out of fashion. And something else happened as well. There was what the textbooks call the marginal revolution in the 1870s where marginal theory replaced uh, classical economics. Classical economics, by the way, is a term coined by Karl Marx. Um, and uh, it replaced the, the earlier economics. And um, this was a tripartite revolution. Um, Walras in Switzerland, uh, Menger in Austria, Vienna, and the Jeevans in London, England. Now, uh, 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 Cannon was a fan, an avid fan really, of Je Jeevens. And uh, Jeevens is pretty good. Uh, you know, he's uh, well worth reading. And uh, so he was, uh, he knew Adam Smith inside out and back to front, and he was sick of him being called a great uh, economist. He, he thought he was out of date, outmoded by this marginal revolution, and he wasn't even a socialist. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but Cannon himself, wasn't all that much of a socialist. <laughs> you know, he, he, uh, he, you know, he learnt a lot from Smith and so on and from other liberal thinkers. And he's far more liberal than he imagined he was. But however, he was interested in the new socialism. Now, what is this new socialism? So what is socialism? Well, socialism really is a new word for Toryism. You know, it is a new word for the old one nation Tory philosophy, collectivism, if you like. Uh, it is collectivistic rather than individualistic, and the liberalism is individualistic rather than collectivist. So it's a new word for uh, Toryism. And uh, if you have a look at the, uh, the uh, revolt against the Industrial Revolution, as it's often called, Coleridge, Wordsworth, people like that, and you have a look at their writings and their political writings, you'll find that they have nearly all of the writings that uh, was later nourished by Marx. Uh, nearly all the writings, including uh, you know, the communism of no money, no money com communism, 
uh, the getting rid of the market economy altogether has been a problematic and so on. And that, that is the and there was a short time when Marx himself joined the Tory party after the after uh, Ingalls' father died and he came into a lot of money. <laughs> Marx himself joined the local Tory party uh, just for the company, I suppose. Or talk to the old chaps. And, uh, and of course, the uh, the leading uh, the leading um, socialist Marxist in England, Heinemann, was of course earlier on a, a, a leading member of the Tory party before he uh, you know, went to, to form the Social Democratic Federation, uh, which uh, had many splits, uh, but eventually evolved into, or a segment of it evolved into uh, Communist Party of Great Britain. Uh, it's Heinemann, but that was after Heinemann's death, well after Heinemann's death. There were other splits. You know, uh, in in the Social Democratic Federation, me, I'm in, uh, earlier on was a Tory, was a leading Tory. Um, so you know, uh, but anyhow, Edwin Cannon was interested in socialism, so he decided to join the Fabian Society. Uh, now, of course, uh, Beatrice Potter, who married Sidney Webb and became Beatrice Webb herself, was uh, earlier on uh, uh, a very good liberal. She was, in fact, the secretary of Herbert Spencer. And, um, but she converted, uh, she fell in love with uh, Joseph Chamberlain, so she converted to municipal socialism and then to Fabianism and so on. And uh, anyway, these were the, the leading couple in the Fabian society were the Webbs, and they later on became the leading couple in the uh, Labour Party. And in fact, they, and they alone, are responsible for the clause for the, the Blair repealed because clause four was given in the 1918 conference as a sop to the webs. I mean, the rest of the conference wasn't interested in it, but the webs were very interested in clause four, and it was given to them as a sop because they were the leading couple. And of course, they, they were a big couple in, in, in British society. They founded the London School of Economics. Uh, and so um, he applied, and they uh, reviewed him in one or two other chapters. Brian Wallace and one or two others uh, tested old uh, Cannon out. And, but Cannon turned out to be too frank and critical. And they, and they said he wasn't a socialist and they wouldn't let him in. And so he, re he rejected. However, later on, um, they did give him the post of the first head of the department and the first professor of, of economics at the London School of Economics. So uh, they did think that he, you know, his interview did do him some good. But anyway, that was so. That's where the Murray Rothbard thing came from, and that's the it comes from Cannon. And he, uh, but Cannon himself, uh, whilst the young man he tried to join the Fabian Society, he he didn't regret the criticisms he made of the Fabian Society, and he drifted slowly, 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 back towards the liberal fold, the Christian liberal fold, and in fact he advocated the gold standard. He was one of the first persons who said Churchill was right to go on the gold standard. And he wrote many articles against Keynes, uh, showing that it was right to go on the gold standard. You, you might have been mistaken in that, but the point is, is uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a thing that a lot of liberals favor. But anyway, uh, so, um, so that's the, uh, now Adam Smith, uh, The Wealth of Nations, uh, I'm mainly going to talk of it as a piece of liberal propaganda, if you like. Uh, but I'm going to also uh, have a swift look at the, at the book. Um, many people say it's not very original. He didn't set out to be original. Um, it was about, set out to be... Uh, remember, uh, Smith was writing as a moral philosopher. He had earlier been the uh, professor of moral philosophy at uh, Glasgow, Glasgow University. And uh, he set out to write a textbook of economics. And he gathered a lot of people, uh, you know, the ideas of Petty, Locke, Newton, uh, all these people, uh, De Devonport, um, and of course the French economists, who are now called physiocrats. All these people, he wanted to uh, gather their ideas and put it into a textbook. But of course he was also, as well as writing this textbook, interested in advocating liberty and the benefits of liberty and what liberty will do. And liberty, you know, the free trade, liberty. Um, now, of course, um, he did have uh, a great admiration for traditional uh, British society. 
Uh, and this, uh, you know, many people say you can find almost anything in Adam Smith. Uh, but, you know, um, he uh, did admire British society as it was, but he expected things to go well in the future and for it to change and go towards free trade. Now, he didn't think that free trade would come about in his lifetime or anything like his lifetime. Not in, he thought in terms of a couple of centuries' time. But he did think that this would bring prosperity. Now, many people writing on Adam Smith say, uh, well, of course, he, the Industrial Revolution changed everything. For the life of me, I don't know what they mean. <laughs> now, of course, they've got this little word, which I've already used in the Marginal Revolution. Um, this little word, revolution, which I think is a, you know, a bit of a, a constituted blank, really. I think it's a bit of a... Uh, uh, a spooky tooth sort of word. Uh, of course, originally it meant uh, return to the uh, status quo ante. In 1688, it was used to go back from 1688 to 1685 before King James came on the throne. But then later on in the French, when it was used by the French, it was used more less like a revolution, as I said before, going off on a tangent to something new. Uh, but in, in any case, uh, they decided to apply it to the Industrial Revolution, which was... Uh, uh, going over a period of 100 years' time. Uh, what they meant by this, I don't know. Uh, well, I suppose they, they, they were certainly referring to it. I mean, it's obvious that they were referring to a whole bunch of innovations. And there was indeed, from 1750 to 1850, a tremendous lot of innovations. But would any of those innovations at all have surprised Smith? My guess is that not one of them would have. Now, of course, they're all new innovations. He wouldn't have known about them by definition. Uh, but there was any number of innovations during his lifetime the, 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 of course he had to discover them about and, and of course he wasn't uh, innovations wasn't thin on the ground in Smith's lifetime and they're not thin on the ground in the wealth of nations he talks about innovations all the time society's going forward all the time society's remaining stagnant or society's falling back so I don't think there's anything in, the, in, in what we call the industrial revolution that would have any effect whatsoever on the economics of Adam Smith. Now, of course, there is, um, I mean, I've already indicated why Adam Smith is defunct to some extent. There is the marginal revolution, and there are other developments in economics, uh, some developments even before the marginal revolution in David Ricardo, uh, which uh, may well uh, amend many of the things that Smith says, uh, but they aren't owing to the industrial revolution or to new innovations or to changes in society. They're owing to changes in economic theory. And uh, I'm not saying that Adam Smith is a finished product, far from it. Uh, however, I do think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a splendid uh, uh, romp through economic theory and uh, it has lots of merit. Uh, and it has to do merit as well as, as, as anything else in life. Uh, but uh, yes, so, so I think that uh, this business uh, that I keep reading about all the time, the, the Industrial Revolution puts a new slant on it. Uh, what do they have in mind? I don't think they have anything in mind. Uh, you know, uh, but, uh, so I don't think that the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, I, think it's a mis I think it's a misnomer, of course. I, I, I suppose I'd, I'd even want to say the Marginal Revolution is a misnomer. There was a change in, in marginal theory, certainly. There was an innovation in economic theory, undoubtedly. Um, so, um, now, Smith um, basically wanted to eulogise liberty and what liberty did, and he, he thought that liberty would bring about uh, the greatest happiness and the greatest progress, the greatest wealth. Uh, the, the more liberal society is, the better it will be, the happier it will be, the, 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 the more people will get on with each other and so on. Um, uh, now, however, he, he did see this for the future. And he saw it for the very distant future, complete liberalism. Uh, free. And even then, he, he probably thought there would be some role for the state. He wasn't an anarchist by any stretch of the imagination here. I think Rothbard did uh, make an advance over the Smith uh, in being an anarchist rather than a, uh, just a limited statist. Uh, but uh, and nevertheless, I think that Rothbard owes a lot more to Smith than what he imagined. And I think the same is true with Schumpeter. And I think the same is even true with Cannon. Uh, but still, never mind. Uh, you know, uh, Cannon's uh, criticism of Smith is very enlightening. Uh, pardon? Enlightening. enlightening. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think he's, he's good on. Well, I think he makes some mistakes. But he, he thinks Smith is, 
it's wrong in places where I think Smith is not wrong. Uh, I'll come to that a bit later uh, when I deal with one of the aspects of Smith's talk, uh, her thought. So, uh, so really, as a, as a um, you know, basically, he's pushing free trade and he's having a look at the economy and he's having a look at uh, that liberalism helps out. Uh, so, as a kind of like a liberal manifesto, he has a number of uh, uh, topics. One uh, is, and this is where Canon's criticism comes in, and uh, I dealt with it actually in, in very earlier talk of about six years ago, uh, when I was dealing with Canon and when I was looking at uh, why the liberal ideology was eclipsed by socialism, which I've already mentioned in this talk, because uh, Canon was certainly a, a major figure in that. Um, and uh, so Ka Smith has got one idea of Smith is that if you have a complete free market, there will be a tendency towards equal wages. Now, he, he, now he didn't expect you ever to get a situation where you actually have completely equal wages. But he does think that the price system tends towards uh, equal wages. Uh, because if you, uh, and he gives an example of a district, a neighborhood. If there are various jobs in the neighborhood that all people can do, then obviously within that neighborhood, uh, people will go to the jobs which are best paid. And uh, if there's a bit of training involved, they'll do the training. Now, of course, he thinks that this will be offset by, if the job's unpleasant, then he still might have to pay a bit more to get people to do it, and so on, there's things like that. Uh, and then he has a, uh, and he pushes that then from the neighborhood to the society at large, the world at large, saying that this is what will happen in the distant future that there'll be a movement on the, on the, owing to the price system towards the, uh, towards the rough and ready equality of life. Well, just, this will forever be offset by innovation and uh, inventions, new inventions and, and tastes. And, and, and of course, it, it's t totally and utterly offset by things uh, political like barriers to entry and uh, you know, governments trying to set up monopolies and so on. Uh, but he, he envisaged this in the distant future that all that will slow. He didn't think it will in any quick way, but he thinks slowly there'll be a movement towards free trade given the centuries. And he, he was uh, very much influenced by Hume and David Hume. Uh, by the way, uh, I don't know whether you've ever read uh, what Hume said, uh, said was his favourite book, uh, A Theory Concerning the Principles of Morals. It is uh, a tremendous uh, hymn to private property. And uh, it's, 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 it's almost like, it's almost like, uh, well, because you know, Marx loved you, but I don't know how Marx really dealt with him. Because this, this is really almost as good as the economic, it isn't the economic calculation argument, but it's almost as, it's a heavy argument against socialism, against rejecting private property. Uh, the uh, uh, he's, he's not, uh, 1751 book. But you, Smith was influenced by you, who was his tutor. Yeah. Hume was the older man by a few decades. And um, uh, Hume had the idea too that, you know, uh, that over the long time, given centuries, people will gradually make progress and they'll find out the best way and they'll reject. Uh, it'll take them a long time because superstitions are... Uh, both Hume and Smith had the low opinion of reason, by the by. <laughs> they didn't think reason counted for much. But they did think that uh, what counted for a lot was... Uh, innovations and uh, opportunities and things like that. And so, you know, uh, now of course you, you need reason to follow the opportunities of time. But, you know, they did, when they had a, a low opinion of I mean, they had a low opinion of something like the LA is trying to do, making an abstract case for uh, the best thing. Uh, you know, they say, oh, well, that, that's all well and good, but it'll only come when people see the advantages in it, uh, in, in the concrete opportunity. You know, that, that's the sort of thing that Hume and Smith would argue. Uh, so uh, um, he thought, he, and he thought that people would see this. The, the, you know, they'd see the, uh, the within the district. They'd see the uh, inequality of wages. And they'd train themselves, and this would level wages out. Now he thinks that this would happen in in, in society and in the world as a whole, in, given the long run. That uh, eventually there'll be a rough and ready equality of wages in the long run, and uh, so there is a movement in the price system towards equality, and these things like innovations and inventions ensured not only the levelling, but that's the levelling up rather than the levelling down. So, you know, uh, you know the new, uh, and, and uh, he, now Smith thinks that uh, the man in the street absolutely 
uh, exaggerates the difference between the rich and the poor in any modern society. Uh, he completely exaggerates it. And uh, he says, now, first of all, he thinks it's a, there's a money illusion. Money isn't a source of wealth. Wealth is what you actually have access to, what, what you can actually get with the money, or what you have access to in the household and so on. Um, you know, you might have a, a rich household uh, in, in, a, in a country place which uh, has very little money income. You know, so uh, now, and he's looking at, uh, he says, uh, if you, uh, he says, they exaggerate the difference between the rich and the poor in their own society. But if you have a look at anyone in the modern society and then have a look at society 500 years ago, or even the primitive societies of his own day, uh, that still exist in the South Pacific or somewhere, nearly every person is not only better off than the average person in that society, but better off than the chiefs of that society, the heads of that society. Now, this isn't a new idea with Smith. It's in John Locke as well. John Locke said much the same thing, that the modern society has enriched people tremendously, and uh, uh, they, they're a lot better off uh, than, than, than what they consider themselves to be. And, uh, they're, they're, and, and the, the, what they uh, Locke didn't say that the gap between the rich, you know, Smith said, the, it was only Smith who said that they, they exaggerate the difference between the, the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, uh, now, of course, you can put it in arithmetical terms, but you're looking at um, uh, money, and you, you probably, uh, you know, uh, there are probably not all that many different things between, say, someone like me and, and, and perhaps even the richest man in England. You know, he, now, of course, he can. He, he has got access to things that I have access to. But I am more like him than I am like some of the average peasants of, say, 5,000 years ago uh, or, you know, or even 500 years ago. Uh, so, you know, uh, so I think there is something in this. So that's, so that's his first thing, that there is a movement. Now, Cannon thought that this was false, and uh, he noticed that uh, uh, there was an Irishman called, uh, Professor of Economics at Dublin, uh, called Carnes, J.E. Carnes, I think that's how you pronounce it, or is it Carnes? Carnes, Cairns. Carnes, Cairns. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but he was, a, uh, he was at Dublin, and he, uh, he was a good economist. He wrote a very good, good, good book called The Slave Power, which put Smith's uh, arguments in 1861 on slavery, which I'll be coming to in, in a moment, um, and uh, saying that they're quite right, and saying that the North would win. Uh, this was about 1861, just about the early part of the American Civil War. Uh, and that's J.E. Carnes, The Slave Power, uh, quoted by Marx, actually, in Capital. <laughs> you know, Marx quoted by Father Smith in a lot of these things. Um, and uh, so um, Kahn said uh, that uh, this wasn't going to be, that there'd be barriers to entry and so on and so forth. Well, of course, none of this would have surprised Smith, that there were barriers to entry and so on. But he expected the barriers to entry to be broken down, given enough time. In other words, this was part of the uh, the delaying short run uh, phenomena that prevented the it didn't prevent the long run trend, and um, so I think that uh, Carnes's criticism of Smith was pretty poor, and I think uh, Cannon shouldn't have endorsed it, but he did. Um, and so I think that I think this is true. I think this is a truism. This uh, this business of Smith, uh, but we can discuss it in a theory. That there is a, a long run trend towards uh, the equality of wages, and that um, in a couple of years' time, I suppose things will be rough as they are. They'll still be rich and poor and so on. But you'll have, uh, and I suppose Smith's saving argument is you people will be able to refer back to today and say, well, look, the gap isn't so great as it was then. You know that sort of thing. Or, and it, it'd probably be less. I don't know. Anyhow, that's that's one of the Smith's ideas for liberty. It brings for about uh, equality, and and it has no rival in being about equality. Uh, and I think that's right. And so now I'm not. I don't particularly favour equality myself. But if you do favour equality, you want to back the free market. <laughs> but but uh, uh, so that's uh, now um, the second one is war. Um, now. Uh, Smith and Jane had said on war because 
as I said earlier on, he was very conservative in many ways. He admired uh, the military establishment. He admired great generals and so on. He admired courage. And um, he admired uh, uh, military uh, accomplishment. He thought that uh, people, uh, you know, Hannibal was a great man, that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, he thought they were great generals. And uh, he even has a, a, uh, arm, uh, an argument in favour of a standing army. And he even says, in the short run, a standing army is uh, the greatest uh, asset for liberty. It will defend the... Uh, uh, but it, uh, it'll defend the um, most extensive liberty uh, against the aggressors, because he, he sees the world, he sees the problem of defence that we have, and we've still got it. I mean, the problem of defence is, in a sense, a sort of artificial problem because it's set up by these various nation states. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if, 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 uh, if there was none of these nation states, there'd be no problem, but we have got these nation states, so there is a problem. And that's the problem of defence, and we've got to, you've got to uh, maintain uh, defence while you've got this problem. But we, we were, now if you had, uh, if if liberalism came back into fashion as it did after uh, after eighteen hundred, I mean, uh, you know what happened? Of course, Smith didn't expect it to come into fashion for a, a long time. But in actual fact, his book itself uh, uh, sold like hot cakes, and uh, the prime the prime minister Pitt read it and. Uh, you know, uh, all the intellectuals in society read it. Uh, you know, people like Tom Paine, people like Edmund Burke, and so on. Everyone read it, and it made a big splash. You read it, of course. And um, about 1890, liberalism became the fashion, and liberalism remained the fashion for about 70 years until you know, until Cannon was a young man, and you had the rise of socialism. Uh, and in that day, you had things like Cobden. Uh, Going, uh, putting forward a, uh, uh, an election address to the people, saying that I'm against the factory acts and so on, and I'm against compulsory education and so on. And uh, you, know, you read through it and you think, oh my goodness, man's an idiot, he's going to lose this election by a mile. He's being too radical, you know. <laughs> uh, but of course, uh, he wins the election and, he, he, well, he loses the, he does lose the election, but he only loses the election because. Uh, he forgets to remind the voters to turn out to vote. And he said, if it was taken next week, I'd win it. He says, I'll certainly win it in five years' time or whenever the seat falls. And he did. He got them to come out and he won it by, by a mile. You know, on this program, on, on, on the kind of libertarian alliance type, type of program. Uh, it's not popular now, but it was popular then. And it was popular from about... Now, why was it so popular? Um, well, like... The Wealth of Nations, of course, was a factor in it, but also there was the philosophical radicals, Bentham, James Mill, Francis Place, these were brilliant propagandists. And of course, they didn't only put liberalism up there, they also put something which Schumpeter, who I mentioned earlier, might think is the antithesis to liberalism. In fact, he wrote a book called Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy in 1944, where he said that this would be the end of liberalism, namely democracy. They also put democracy up there. But the reason why they put democracy up there is because they saw democracy as being friendly to liberalism. Because from about 1800 to about 1870, democracy was friendly to liberalism. You know, it was the, a vote winner. Uh, uh, but you know, that, you know, since about 1870, that's, that, that, you know, that, that's uh, ceased to be the case. Um, but anyhow, it was the case for uh, a fair time. So, uh, so Smith has got this argument uh, in favour of standing armies, and he goes through it. He says, uh, he says, he says, most liberals might think that uh, a militia is a good thing. Don't have a standing army. Many people fear a standing army. That it's a threat uh, to liberty, and he admits that it can be a threat to liberty in the wrong hands. Uh, but he says, if you have a standing, if you have a standing army in the division of labour, uh, it will defeat any militia dead easy. Uh, and he, go, he goes through Hannibal's career, uh, and he says Hannibal was one of the first people to have a standing army. And he marched from Spain over the Alps into uh, Italy and to attack Rome. And he says Rome had a militia in those days. And of course, Hannibal just flattened them. And uh, 
and he, you know, he had him in battle after battle, but he, he wouldn't go and take Rome, and he was poorly you know, provided by cartridge. Uh, but then uh, his army got rusted because they didn't have much, uh, uh, they didn't have many battles, and Scorpio the, copied Hannibal's tactics and won a lot of little battles and, and developed the Roman militia <coughs> into a standing army. So uh, by the time that Hannibal was called back from Italy to defend Cartridge, when Scorpio was about to uh, uh, take it, um, Scorpio had a, a well-trained standing army, and uh, Scipio. Scipio, I think. Yeah. Scipio? Oh, I thought it was Scorpio. I beg your pardon. Scipio. <laughs> Scipio had a... What's the difference? No, well, I'm very bad at pronouncing words. I beg your pardon. Um, you pronounced it correctly. Skip you had the wrong word. <laughs> Scipio. Scipio uh, won this argument, uh, won this battle because uh, half of Hannibal's army was a militia, made up of militia, the, the ordinary cartridge militia. So, uh, so he has this argument for that, and he, he says that it's, it's, um, it will uh, protect liberty if it's kept out of politics. Uh, and um, so uh, he's got this, uh, you know, but he does, now part of this is he's worrying about uh, an effect of the division of labor, which is earlier eulogized, that it's actually um, uh, being uh, detrimental to the arts of war, that it's actually destroying the arts of war. And um, he thinks that this is a terrible thing, and he, he thinks that uh, perhaps it can be uh, countered, you know, because people are just getting, uh, becoming experts at their job, but they need a division of labor, and they're no good for anything else. Well, he's been influenced by Rousseau in this. He thinks that uh, there was a time when the noble savage did everything, and he was a full man, a rounded man, whereas the division of labor has produced people who are uh, somewhat lopsided towards their various trades. And uh, he says that it, it, he says that the arts of war has uh, declined so much in society that men are even becoming cowards. He says that this is terrible for a he says it's terrible for a man to be a coward. You're not really a man unless you you know you've got some courage. And uh, so uh, so he laments this. But on the other hand, then he goes to the other extreme, which is the more liberal thing. You know, it's a it's a, a, a paradigm or a meme started off by. Uh, Erasmus, uh, after the uh, uh, Battle of Flodden, uh, I think it was, where, where uh, in Henry VIII's time, where Henry was in France and his queen, uh, the, uh, uh, the Spanish lady, uh, took charge of the battle. The bleeding infant. Ka Katrina. Katrina. Catherine. Catherine, yeah. Uh, Catherine took, took, took charge of the battle and won the Battle of Flodden and killed a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, Erasmus's students got killed in that battle, and so Erasmus came out with a, an argument against war, which was the uh, became the liberal argument against war, saying for the first time ever war was bad, and this brought for you know this brought for the long uh, line of people uh, arguing against war, and it ends up in Smith, uh, uh, who, who then picks it up and goes the opposite way to what he's done about. Standing army and saying, and saying that uh, well maybe the good side of the uh, arts being declined, free trade will in fact remove the incentive to war, because if you have complete free trade, it will be like the uh, perfect empire. All interests will be in common. It will be kind of like the one economy, and all uh, and uh, there will be no reason why anyone should go to war. And so this so Smith puts forward this. So the grand solution to war, it's been put forward before Smith, but he embraces it. And of course, Cobden and Bright, when they um, you know, picked up this, you know, they had a single volume, uh, and they used to carry it up and down this country like a, like a Bible, you know, and address the public meetings up and down the country, and folk from it, you know. They, they left out the, uh, uh, the stuff on Hannibal and standing army and so on, and they just wrote Very wise, I think. <laughs> and they just, they just wrote it. The fact that free trade will get rid of, will remove the incentive to war. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, so, so, so that's another thing. He, he is, uh, although he eulogizes war to some extent and eulogizes the standing army and eulogizes the military tradition, he also sees that the uh, modern society is causing it to ebb. He's frightened about that, but he doesn't say, you know, you, you should all go into the standing army. He says it should be perhaps a broad education that might 
that might counter, that might bring people, you know, give them a wiser horizon than this uh, nick and division of labor. Uh, so, you know, so, so, he did, so he puts forward the equality of wages and war. Now, the next thing is uh, slavery. Now, he hates slavery. Again, he wasn't the first person to hate slavery. Um, slaves hated slaves. slavery. <laughs> Quite disliked it. Well, you know, uh, slavery is an old institution. And, um, uh, and as he says, you know, uh, uh, of course, while, while, while he's writing... Board, board and lodging. You get it? What, what, yeah, what, 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 while he's writing... Uh, uh, it, it, uh, you know, we tend to think now that slavery is like the uh, transatlantic thing from Africa to America. But of course, when Smith was writing in 1776, there were a hell of a lot of slaves still in Europe, quite a few. And um, you know, and we know that the Slavs, are, you know, is, you know the, people have argued about this. The Slavs is kind of like slaves related to slaves. Most of the slaves in the history of, of the world have been in Central Europe and. Uh, Eastern Europe, that, that, that area, the, 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 the area of the Slavs. And of course, the, the, uh, many of the practices uh, for the Atlantic slave trade, the, the practices of the plantations, were uh, on the uh, Western Mediterranean, uh, you know, uh, the uh, practices that were then transferred from the, uh, the Western Mediterranean to the West Indies and then to Southern America and then to Brazil and so on. You know, the slave trade was uh, in Europe and in uh, in the Mediterranean and in Northern Europe, long before it went to 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 uh, uh, the Americas. But of course, what you had with the Americas is the Negroes from from uh, from Africa, uh, you know, which, and and we've still got the legacy of that today. Uh, but we forget that in Smith's day, there was a hell of a lot of slavery in Europe. And slavery is you know, slavery is endorsed by the major religions, the three major great Western religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all endorse slavery. The thing that's against slavery is, of course, the Libertarian Alliance ideology, liberalism. That's, that's, well, that's the anti slavery. A bit late in the field, aren't we? Well, no, it's like, uh, not, not, not really. The, 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 the LAs are late in the field. But, but, but uh, the liberal ideology were, were, came into the field in the abolitionist course. You're quite right. But of course, it's true that, um, it's true that Christianity did. A liberal interpretation of Christianity did play a large part in the abolition of slavery. Uh, and Wilberforce, for example, was certainly a sincere Christian, uh, as well as being a, a liberal and giving a liberal uh, reading of, the, of Christianity. I should point out at this juncture that Adam Smith is an inexhaustible source of interest, and our speaker is an inexhaustible source of um, uh, uh, remarks. Um, are we drawing, to, drawing towards a Conclusion. I've been going on for too long. <laughs> well, when I should point out, in case it worries you, that David likes to have lots of notes to which he does not refer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, yeah, but there's, a, there's a number of. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, so uh, imperialism, I'll just cover it. How much time we got? Oh, 10 minutes. Uh, I'll cover imperialism then. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> Imperialism, uh, you know, most people today uh, seem to think that the imperialism is uh, how Britain got rich and so on. In fact, I think that was slavery. I think that's partial. I don't think slavery uh, helped Britain to get rich at all. I don't think the empire did. I think Smith was right on both of those. He said slavery was an economic drain on, 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 the, on the people who practiced it, and the free labor would always beat it every time. Uh, I think he's right on that. And he said that imperialism was the attempt to set up monopolies, which was uneconomic and backward. And the, uh, not only did it hold the countries back that it ruled, and hold, uh, it also held the mother country back, and the mother country had to pay a massive problem of defense for the empire. And uh, he says at length, uh, you know, the, you know, it's, it's a product that you know, both slavery and Imperialism are products of vanity. He says that men, uh, in their in their vanity, will uh, uh, will uh, do outrageous things and which cost them hell of a lot of money and uh, and uh, going for hell of a lot of wastage just for sheer vanity. And uh, uh, he thinks that uh, although he says I can show you that um, uh, imperialism is uh, very very wasteful, he says there's not many people in Britain and it's costing Britain a lot. Paying the whole of defence and he can't really pay it. He's got this. He's got this massive national debt, 
Uh, and people are no longer worried about it, he says, but he says they ought to be worried about it because it's massive. And it's owing to the defense of the empire. Uh, and uh, it'll break Britain just like it's broken the other empires. But many British people think it won't break Britain. But it will, it's getting more worse and worse, and it ought to be paid off. And it, and it hasn't been paid off. Uh, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, I think you're right on all this, because it still hasn't been paid off, of course. It's worse than ever now. But, 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 but uh, so uh, he said, nevertheless, uh, the vanity of people is such that they, uh, you won't find the ruling class willing to let go of, it, of even the most insignificant uh, part of their empire. Because of uh, because they don't like to let things go, even when it's not costed, even when it's costing them things with the nose, they don't like to lose things. Uh, so he says, uh, it, he says, but of course, if if Britain did, uh, if Britain did uh, let the empire go, he, he, of course, he himself uh, was uh, bitten by this bug, and he admitted it. He says, he, he says, I don't like to see the America, the Americans go free of Britain. He said, and he says, I. I'll go to a long way to uh, to keep the empire together. He said, even that we could move the capital from London to Philadelphia uh, and have a capital in Philadelphia instead of in London, and we keep keep together. But he says, what what must happen is that uh, the Americans must pay for the late war, meaning the Seven Years' War. Uh, and he, he thought that uh, Dr. Johnson's pamphlet, uh, taxation, uh, no tyranny was right, you know, that uh, the colonies had to pay for the war. And uh, that's a long volume. Um, so, you know, being that I went down, I might as well read, read out some of this, uh, you know, only a little bit. Uh, and um, I'm going to read a little bit out. But, uh, you know, he, he said that you haven't got a, a, a proper empire Anyway, he says it's a shadow of an empire. He, he says that they've. Uh, he says if you tax them now, obviously they'll protest. He says, of course they. You've tried to tax them, and they've said no taxation without representation. He says, well, I agree with that, and so hence we move the. We might have to move the capital to Philadelphia. You know, they certainly should be represented and so on. Uh, but he says presently, uh, you know, it's, a, it's just a sham, and this is the you know, this is the very end of his volume, uh, the last page. The rulers of Great Britain have, for more than a century past, amused the people with the imagination that they possessed a great empire on the west of the Atlantic. This empire, however, has hitherto existed in the imagination only. It has hitherto been not an empire, but a project of an empire. Not a gold mine, but a project of a gold mine. A project which has cost and which continues to cost, and which, if pursued in the same way as it has been hitherto, is likely to cost immense expense without being likely to bring in any profit. For the effects of the monopoly of the colony trade, it has been shown, are to the great body of people a mere loss instead of profit. It is, sh it is surely now time that our rulers should either realise this golden dream which they have been indulging themselves, perhaps as well as the people, or that they should awake from it themselves and endeavour to awaken the people. If the project cannot be completed, that is, if they don't pay proper taxation around the colonies and pay for their own defence, if the project cannot be completed, it ought to be given up. If at any time, uh, uh, if any of the provinces of the British Empire cannot make uh, cannot be made to contribute towards the support of the whole empire, it is surely time that Great Britain should free herself from the expense of defending those provinces in time of war and of supporting any part of their civil or military establishments in time of peace and endeavour to accommodate her future views and designs to the real mediocrity of her circumstances. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so that's, you know, that, that's the easy... Yeah. You know, there's a hell of a lot against. Uh, you know, he's worth reading on, on on war, on slavery, and on empire imperialism. And I think he's. I think uh, the, the current position on empire now, you know, the idea that you know all these empires uh, contributed towards the riches of the 
uh, west, and we would call it west for the want of a better word. Uh, he, uh, completely fallacious what contributed to the riches of the West, of course, is the, inno the innovations in the so-called Industrial Revolution. You know, that's the sort of thing that contributes to riches, real productivity, not, uh, uh, you know, not ordinary work. Very good. Very good. Thank you, David. Uh, it's been a while since I read Rothbard's critique of uh, oh, Smith, and I've never read Schumpeter's critique of Smith, from which you say it was taken, let alone the lectures of Callum, from which you say that Schumpeter was taken. Uh, so my question is rather ill-formed, but my recollection many years ago of reading Rothbard's economic history uh, is that his attack on Smith's economics was that he thought that Smith had actually taken economics backwards, and that his proposition was that the economists that, that had come before Smith, really going back, Kantian, going well, certainly I, I, I recall he uh, uh, he suggested that if you went back to the so-called Catholic scholastics, uh, that he said that uh, that Smith did not. Uh, that Smith's economic theory was not an advance on what had come before. It wasn't even a summation or helpful summary of what had come before. It was actually retrograde. And that uh, important ideas uh, in economics uh, which underpin ideas of liberalism and so on and so forth, which had already been in existence before Smith, that Smith's work actually damaged those ideas. Uh, now, I'm afraid I can't remember any, any, any particular instances of that, so that's why it's a pretty rubbish question. But, but do you have any r response to that very vague well, I think, summary I, I think of what the, I think Rothbard said? Yeah, yeah, well, I think you'll find the same in Schumpeter. He says the same sort of thing. And in, 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 and in Cannon. Uh, but I think that they, they, they especially praise an Irishman called Can. I think um, Cantillon. Yeah. Yeah. Cantillon. Cantillon. Yeah. It was Irish, but in yeah. France. Yeah. In France, yeah. he was in France, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, he died young. And he, uh, but Smith incorporated a lot of his ideas, I think. You know, I, th I think it's, it's uh, you know, I think I think he came from uh, Cannon's uh, tiredness of Smith, uh, you know, having going over and over his ideas. Uh, I don't. I, don't, I, I think. I don't think that uh, Smith went back, necessarily was a step backwards step from Kantian. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll have to sort out Rathbard and, and read him. I might give a talk on Rathbard sometime. He may have been a better propagandist, but a poorer theoretician, perhaps. Well, Kantian uh, died very young, didn't he? That's and uh, didn't, didn't have, uh, you know, he was, very, he was a pretty obscure chap, and, uh, you know, Old um, Cannon had uh, found him and uh, and uh, and uh, promoted his works uh, quite a bit, but Cannon himself was uh, you know, he, he was very fond, as I said in uh, earlier on, very fond of Jevons and Wicksteed and people like that, you know. And he was looking, he thought that they were just street ahead of Smith. You but know, that would be an unfair attack. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But I mean, he, that's the reason why he was. <laughs> That's the reason well, why he's sick of Smith, Rothbard, and the reason why he's almost willing to say anything yes, against Smith. But Rothbard's attack on Smith was not with the benefit of hindsight, uh, as, as I read it. It was, it was if you looked at what had come before Smith, yeah. it was better than Smith. Yeah. And so Smith's work actually was a retrograde step. That, I think, yeah. is essentially what Rothbard said. Yeah. Uh, my, my guess is that's probably, probably wrong, probably hyperbole. But, you know, uh, I thought so at the time. I mean, uh, I think I did read it. You know, I'd like to have a look at these Catholics. Who, you know, you know, Catholics don't look a good prospect. But, I mean, of course, I'm prejudiced against them because I was brought up as Catholic. <laughs> but but, uh, 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 you know, uh, but Catholics don't look like a very good, uh, you know, like a very good advancing 
doctrine and tradition. They've got a universal in that respect. They've got you know, there's a universal aspect of Kutzam, the Kutzam is But uh, I'd be very, uh, very scared. Well, I did read, you know, I, I, I was, uh, I did read Rathbard on this, and I, I wasn't very impressed. Uh, but uh, later on, I, I read uh, Schumpeter, and then I realized where he got it from, and then I read Cannon, and I realized where Schumpeter got it from. And of course, Car uh, that story about Oh, well, I didn't tell you that story, did I? <laughs> that was a story I... That story uh, you didn't tell us about. Did I tell you the story? No, yeah, you did I tell you the story about uh, Schumpeter asking, uh, going, to the, uh, going to Sydney Webb's lectures and asking questions? Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. well, she, well, he went to Cannon's lectures and he went to... Uh, I thought he was in the talk. He meant to be in the talk. Uh, he, uh, he, he, he went to Cannon's lectures and he uh, found his stuff. And, but he went to Sydney Webb's lectures and uh, he asked the question, and uh, Sidney Webb says, are you an economist? He says, yes, because he's giving talks on economic issues. He says, we don't allow uh, questions from economists in this course. <laughs> <laughs> this is the founder of the... Uh, because that story is from. That story is in the... Uh, I got that from the History of Economic Analysis by Schumpeter. So that's where he's telling it. I was going to say, I got that story that I told you earlier on. I hadn't told you the story. So, to be fair to Sydney and Beatrice, they let in a lot of people they didn't approve of. In oh, sense. yes. Yeah, well, yeah. Hayek was at his home in the London School of Economics. Mm -hmm. But they're outnumbered 100 to 1 by uh, the likes of Lasky. Yes, it's true. What? No questions? What was one there? <laughs> uh, walls, you. Uh, Blamed on the nation states, because there are civil wars as well. Uh, there are civil wars, Probably yes. more, more often uh, in between nation states, and you don't you don't need a standing army as a threat. It seems like it seems to me like an army can be got up quite quickly uh, when a war starts. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and terrorist insurrections. So war is more than just battles between nation states. So it's not simply to say the nation states the cause of war. We got rid of them. That means war, which should be what you were, what you were saying. Yes, yeah, I think that's true. I think so that's true. It's, it's more sophisticated than that. No, but well, the terrorists, uh, why are the terrorists fighting? They're all, always fighting to influence mm. nation states. And I was a little unclear yes. about the economies of empires. Um, the British Empire cost Britain money. But was there anybody gaining out of it? Were the empires that were, were the colonies of Britain, were they, were they usually it said that Britain benefited by taking the money out? And I agree with you. Britain's rich because of the innovations and industrial innovations, some people call a revolution, but the, innovation, the innovations in industry and trade. But um, did, did the empire benefit the colonies? Well, I mean, the, the, uh, the American colonies benefited slightly, if you call it, call it benefit, from being defended against France in the Seven Years' War. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's a. Uh, you know, and and the, they. they uh, they were, they were protected uh, by Britain. So they got, I mean, a bit like uh, you know, Western Europe now is being protected by America, and they're sort of gaining from that, but whether they feel the benefit of it, they probably don't. You know, you know, when, you go, when you're given a benefit like this, like, for example, Western Europe is being defended by, you don't necessarily feel the benefit of it yourself, even though you, you are receiving this benefit. And if we now have to, as Trump is trying to say, pay for NATO and so on, then we'll feel... You know, feel that tax, all right, <laughs> and we might not like it. Uh, uh, you know, but and you know, it's a, but anyway, Smith thinks it's a, uh, it's a, it's a definite cost. You know, uh, and he couldn't. Uh, Smith thought that he couldn't go on. That it, uh, either, uh, as I said, you know, you know, either he would have to, uh, the, the empire would have to contribute to the defence, or Britain couldn't just would collapse under the weight of it. it wasn't big enough to wasn't rich enough to maintain the empire in this way. Uh, no, I think, I think politics as a whole, you know, looking at it all, I think, no, I think the answer is no one benefits from it. I think it is a, what we call a negative sum game. You know, it is a mistake, basically a wasteful mistake. Sort of random observations. Uh, first is just a possible response to Paul's suggestion that civil war might be a partial refutation of Smith's idea. Now, I, 
I would say, uh, I don't know whether you agree with this, David, that generally civil wars consist of a struggle for control or a nation state. Yeah, oh, I so think I did say I'm that. Sure they are uh, necessarily a heritage. Second point, completely different. Uh, just, uh, uh, just one wonders what Smith would have thought of the strenuous efforts made by British politicians. Uh, not just conservative politicians, but some Labour politicians, to ensure that Britain, quotes, continues to have a nuclear deterrent so that it continues to have a seat on the Security Council of the United Nations. And when one talks about the vanity of politicians yeah. and the desire to, uh, to continue to have something like an empire, uh, it might be said that that's uh, a modern example of exactly that phenomenon. Yeah, uh, sure it is. And then my third uh, observation is perhaps more in, in the nature of a question, therefore being justified um, in talking now, which is, do you think it might be said that those who were granted monopolies on the empire arrangements did actually benefit? Uh, well, yeah, some merchants did, yeah. Yes, quite. So, so one can't say as a blanket proposition that nobody benefited, but one can probably say that overall... Uh, well, yeah, that is what a negative sum game means. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, if I'm attacked in the street and robbed of my wallet, it'll be a negative sum game. <laughs> it sure would be. Uh, but, but, but that doesn't... <laughs> that doesn't... Both parties. <laughs> well, the, 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 the people who actually rob me will only get three pounds. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> so they won't be better, very much better off. But they might say that that's some gain is better than nothing. You know, so I'm not saying that a negative sum game is somewhere where no one gains. I'm saying that on the whole, the sum, you know, negative sum, yeah. the sum is negative. But then if one poses the question, right. then, why were there empires? It might not just have been a question of vanity. It might have been that there were some groups that did benefit. Oh, yeah, well, Smith does say that. And, and in fact, that's... Uh, I said earlier on that he thought that reason was weak. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why he thought reason was weak is that he thought there's too many interests. You know, but a lot of these interests, he thought that vanity outweighed the interests. So he thought that vanity was an even bigger factor than the interests. But he thought, yes, there was a lot of interest. And of course, uh, it's also the fact, I mean, if you, I don't know whether you ever read the uh, book with the, perhaps, the, the, you know, the Norman Angels, The Great Illusion. Where, where he, I know the theory. Uh, where we, we, we put forward the same theory, you know, free trade, 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 war. You know, Angel goes through no end of people. Now, all these people think that war is a benefit. And, you know, uh, you know it isn't only the university students who think that imperialism is the reason why the, uh, the uh, West got rich. You know, the actual people themselves in Parliament and so on, they think they're gaining as well. So it isn't as though, you know, uh, uh, the delusion of being gain, you know, what, what, uh, what uh, Angel calls the great delusion, that war actually pays. Yes, Angel, Angel's theory yeah. was that war would not... Well, it's the same theory as his. Yeah, applied to empire. Uh, yeah, well... That's an analogy for war, yeah. I suppose. Well, it's, just, it's exactly the same idea. And, just, and it comes from... The, the first person to have it was Erasmus. He developed it after... Uh, the Battle of Loven, and, and it's come through any number of uh, theories. Smith is one of them, lots of others, of course. And, uh, and then it's come down through Richard, Richard Cobden and John Bright, and then into Norman Angel. Any more? I thought war helped. No. If you think about how China was, you know, sort of a thousand years ago, the big fish was organised and centrally run. Whereas Europe, we were just like mud huts and a few castles not going to crap out of each other. But it's the fact that in Europe we had lots and lots and lots of wars, which actually made us think, oh, we better sharpen our game a bit, you know, comparative competitive advantage. But is that why wars helped? Is, is that the argument? Uh, no, uh, he, he did think that wars, uh, a standing army, he talked about, he did think a standing army uh, deterred. Invasion. And it's also thought it deterred terrorism and civil war and so on. The standing army deterred that. A quick one at the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said Smith was uh, against slavery. Uh, indeed, yeah. 
was that on moral grounds or economic grounds? On economic grounds and moral grounds. Both. Uh, oh yeah, sure, both. But mainly, uh, mainly he talks about the economics of slavery, and uh, you know, he says that uh, you know, uh, first of all, he thinks that people indulge in uh, in mistreating these slaves rather than getting them to work. He thinks that's an end in itself. He thinks they can afford that because the grounds they're working is so rich. So he thinks that if you have free labour in there, you get more, you know, more produce, more profits from sugar and so on. Uh, so he thinks the free labour is just more, much more effective than, than slavery. Uh, you know, he thinks it's, and uh, he did, he does say that uh, he says when you have a look at a, a comparatively liberal country like England which allows, uh, you know, which the law doesn't interfere in everything and allows people to go on roughly freely, since the slaves are worse treated because the master can then, you know, uh, mistreat the slaves. Whereas if you have a, a, a relatively totalitarian place like France or less free place like France, where the law interferes everywhere, then the law does uh, give the slaves some protection and that means the master uh, needs to watch himself with the slave, and that makes a, that slave labour a bit more like free labour. It doesn't make it free, but it makes it a bit more like free labour. So he thought that French slavery uh, was more humane than British slavery uh, because of this, because French had a more extensive law and, uh, and looked into it uh, uh, more thoroughly, whereas the British tended to have a laissez-faire attitude, which allowed more abuse and therefore made slavery even uh, less economic than it might be if you had more respect for the slaves. That's uh, just a story. I'm sorry. That's just a story rather than any, anything based on it. You reckon that's yeah. false? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, could you further explain Smith's view that um, the equality naturally arises from um, a situation of um, freedom because it seems to contradict a lot of the contemporary free market thought like Hayek uh, for example thought that uh, economic inequality was necessary for economic prosperity so they create incentives for people to do work that they wouldn't have otherwise have done um, so what did Smith mean exactly when uh, well, like, or what was this thought process doing that? It's, uh, you know, it's, if things you know, things for the price system to uh, give you incentives, you've got to have a, uh, offices open for the people to go in to take the incentives. So, uh, you know, it's, it's true that, uh, uh, but what, what happens, I mean, what happens with profit, with normal profit? Uh, you know, if a firm innovates something, in, uh, you know, uh, a new line of fashion, uh, it makes a tremendous profit because it's in there on its own. But what happens is to the other firms come in and uh, share the profit, they make fashion similar. And this brings the profit down to what the economists often call normal profit, which means it's almost not profit at all. You know, uh, I think Schumpeter was best on profit. You know, uh, where, you know, profit is the reward for entrepreneurship and the reward for innovation. Uh, and what happens is that you have a high price and then people go in. So the way how the market works is things get scarce, high prices put on them, people go in and produce things, they produce more of that particular thing and then the price comes down. Well, that happens to wages as well. They tend to level out. You know, now, of course, there's a lot of short-run phenomenon uh, that will perhaps forever uh, put off a complete equality of wages. But if you look, have a look in the round, instead of you know, take centuries, you'll find that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, almost anyone today is more equal than, say, uh, and more alike each other. The richest person and the poorest person is more alike in their standard of living than, the, than uh, almost anyone, say, 500 years ago. Are you saying as regards their happiness? No, I'm saying as regards their income. And, and they're all better off as well. And, and, and the, the, the poorest person in today's society is probably uh, better off than the richest person 500 years ago. So there's this tendency to equality. There's only as much equality as it's economic to have. Any more equality would be Economic. There's a long, there's a long run tendency towards complete equality. You'll never get there because of short run phenomena 
like innovation, uh, invention, and uh, changes in taste, changes in fashion, and so on, uh, which offset you know, uh, you know profit profit is on Schumpeter's view, which I think is probably right. Uh, profit is related to innovation. You know, you, you get a heavy profit when you do something new that people want. And uh, but people come in to share that, and that brings the profit down. That's the mechanism. The price mechanism is a, the price mechanism itself is a mechanism towards equality. The price mechanism itself. Now, of course, it doesn't achieve full equality. And it may never do. But what you get, given the generations, if you compare any generation, you go back say 500 years or 600 years or even 100 years, what you get is a rough equality for that generation. You know, the gap, as Smith says, the gap between the richest people and the uh, poorest people in the society is not all that great. It's exaggerated by the man in the street. You know, I'm not all that much worse off than the richest man in Britain. Oh, the poorest man in Britain. <laughs> I'm not all that much worse off. The important contemporary implication of this is that if you look, is that if you want to understand why there are, in some cases, big differences in income between different professions and so on and so forth. What you need to look at is the barriers to entry. You know, because you'll often find, say for example, my own profession, I'm a lawyer. Lawyers earn, relative to others, more than they should. Not because they're evil people and they're cunning and so on and so forth. Though that helps. <laughs> but there is also another factor, which is that lawyers have been very good at erecting barriers to entry. So that it is very, very difficult to practice as a lawyer unless you've gone through a lot of uh, hoops. True, true. And that keeps the number of lawyers down. The same is true for medicine. And, uh, I'll, uh, and in a true free market, which Smith is talking about, most of all of those barriers can be there. One of the consequences of that is that it would be much easier for lawyers, doctors, and others to meet with competition. And it tends to be So I think that's essentially Smith's point. But the implication is look around you and look to see where the barriers are, and you'll find that they are very often responsible for the many large differences in income from the jobs. So coming at the side angle on equality, because it's been mentioned a few times in a few different ways, I think, I think it's top bill, but I don't think it's fair. Um, but if you think of the railway children, and Bernard Cribbins playing the station master, he porter. worked he hard. A, he was a porter. He was poor, but he had his values, and he wouldn't take charity when I he was proud. And he was, in, in terms of the process of work ethic, or whatever it was, every bit as equal as your big person owning the factory. And I think in those terms, by the values of the day, it didn't matter how much you earned, you were equal according to how hard you worked, your Protestant work ethic, your values. So I think we should all become Protestants. Right. <laughs> 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 I'll make it. Right. 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 That helps. Um, something that muddies any discussion of uh, economic inequality <laughs> <laughs> is um, oh, social no. mobility. So, for example, Thomas Sowell found that like the twenty, the, t the bottom twenty percent are in the top twenty percent at later stages of their careers. So, when we measure uh, yeah. inequality, what we're actually measuring is like age and different stages of. Um, uh, your career. So, uh, did Adam Smith ever comment on the issue of mobility? Oh, uh, that's on my birthday, yeah. Uh, you know, he wanted, uh, he thought that if, you know, his idea of liberty was getting rid of barriers to entry. You know, offices open to all, that sort of thing. Well, there yeah. were restrictions on movement, weren't there? Of course there were, yeah. And he, he advocated, you know, in the long run, not immediately, but as soon as possible, but he thought it would take a couple of centuries. Getting rid of the light, you know, complete liberty. You know, complete liberty, so people you have a, you have a single uh, world market, as it were. You could say he's a favour of globalisation. He also complained about seven-year apprenticeships for yeah. printers, yeah. which, until they all disappeared about 15 years ago, were still seven years to become an apprentice. Why, when I was, work your apprenticeship. In fact, I was about the first batch who went up to five years. Oh, you were seven years? Yeah, the, the people who were training me, but it served seven years. 
You had to learn at which end of a paintbrush to hold. So, yeah, painting, that's right. Anyone could do it in five minutes, but you had to, had to train to do it for seven years. I mean, <laughs> the obvious. Yeah, you alluded to uh, political defections from Tory to social, uh, socialist. Uh, these days, it's about principles like uh, a councillor went from Tory to Labour uh, because of the austerity. No, I, 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 I'm talking about now. So what would make, make anybody go from Tory to socialism? And were they hounded? Were they no, no, I said, I said socialism was a new name for the Tory idea. Right, so That's what I back, said. No, 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 no. Socialism. Uh, uh, you, you said that they, they, was, they were Tories and they went to. No, I said uh, socialism became uh, replaced, replaced liberalism as a fashion. Right. But it was a new name for the Tory idea. Right. Uh, all the ideas in Marx could be found in the Tory party. Right. That's what I said. Right. In Coleridge and. Not all of them. Well, which, uh, well not, 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 not his. Uh, uh, Labour theory of value and all that. No, no, no that is. Uh, well. So not, not his economic theories, but no. his ideas of communism and that sort of stuff. Yeah. His idea of, 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 of how wicked uh, capitalism was, that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. That was in Coleridge and yeah. others, yes. And uh, Wordsworth. Yeah. You just, just further on, the quality of standard living. Um, the way you see it is that uh, we're all now liberated from, with the automated, automation of society. Machines for everything, washing machines, yeah. electric cookers, gas cookers, and stuff, electrical hoopers and things. We're all liberated from, uh, whereas 100 years ago, we had an army of servants to do all of it. Yeah, operators. <laughs> all of these things. All of these things. Now, almost everybody has these devices. Everybody has you know, entertainment in their front room that you would have to pay to see opera to you. You can just, you can have, you can have operas or and massive amounts of entertainment poured directly to your living room. The poorest person in the land has all of this stuff. Yeah. And the richest people differentiate themselves by paying preposterously inflated prices for buying very bespoke goods. Yeah. There's, there's a television program that I call, you know, what the super rich spend their money on. And they spend their money on, but like, you know, the very, very rich might have a yacht or something or a private jet, although most people can afford to, to go on a cruise or a, a, a fly an aeroplane, very least, not a cruise. Um, but uh, what they're buying on, they're buying Christ, uh, Christmas tree baubles, they look the same as the Christmas tree baubles you might buy from Primark, but they're paying, you know, £5,000 for them to have it hand blown, yeah. have it hand blown in Norway, you know, by dwarves or something. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so it's, it's this sort of idiotic, idiotic differentiation. And the people who are selling them the, these, this rubbish, you know, they're, they're the ones taking the, they're, they're equalising by taking the money away from the suckers. They're passing the suckers from their money. But there's nothing more these people can spend their money on. That's right, all yeah. these billions of pounds are the same. They are, so they're much you consume and have and enjoy. And, uh, and to the extent that you have a capacity for enjoyment, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it, most of us can, or, you know, with a bit of effort, you can live the lifestyle of a Roman emperor without, you know, you can't well, be able to kill for your amusement. Well, Smith makes, a, Smith, make, Smith makes, Smith says, not only is the he richer than the tribal chief, but the tribal chief has, say, a couple of thousand people under his uh, uh, serving him. You know. But he says that through the division of labour, any man has any number of people serving him around the world for, in return for his, you know, his mail. As, you know, his, he buys the Daily Mail, say, or, and uh, any number of people have made that, journalists and so on, and printmakers and so on. And then he buys a DVD, and any number of people have made that. And he, and so on. You know, through the division of labour, you've got the, the whole world serving all, almost any individual. They don't cringe so much. They don't <laughs> cow, cow, cow. No, no, no. Well, the, the, you see, well, you know, uh, That's the, always the, pleasant to some. Uh, well, I mean, Smith knows that the uh, tribal chief... Dictators. The tribal chief is, is not, you know, is not in free relations with his, the people he rules over, but the person who's buying the newspaper is in free relations with the uh, with the newspaper, you know, in other words, there is liberty here, but liberty means that we serve each other, you know, we serve each other in the market. Yeah, and I, I go to my office each each day, and it's mainly women there, and they, they, they go in, and a lot of them are worried about the amount of automa automation they're reading about, and they say yes. no, they see that Uber is replacing uh, taxi drivers and there's driverless cars, and delivery men might be replaced by drones, and they're worried that nobody will have a job. Yeah. Now these women come into work, they have a chat, and to their friends, a couple of cups of tea, go to the shop, buy some biscuits, yes. sit down, 
do the hair, go to the toilet, and do the makeup, come back. Exploitation. And, and then, they, then, they get, then they leave at the end of the day. Yes. And they, they think they've done it some work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. it's, yes, I, I, it's, it's just a job that's just going to get easier and easier and easier yeah, and easier I, and easier. I was thinking that. Uh, I'm not saying that. Well, I'll tell you what I did. I saw the same sort of thing. What do you do? I, saw, I saw the same sort of thing. When I, when I was painting at the Midland Bank in 1965, you had these beautiful girls come in, and I was just painting, you know, I was painting, I was working. And uh, I was watching them have a talk, you know, I came in at nine, they talk, oh, and Bobby's going out with Sheila and so on. Yeah, as opposed to yeah, well, quiet. This is no. We weren't talking. We were painting. <laughs> and we were listening. You were listening. Listening. You were looking. Uh, and and then you know, exactly as Paul said. You know, ran about five o'clock. Now we had to work till six. We started at eight. And we had to work till six. You right? tough. I said, well, that's different between it's manual good. work and office workers or bank clerks. <laughs> uh, and at five o'clock, I said, ta-da, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> I said, well, what have they done all day? We, I painted the street. I think, the, I think the male bank clerks had it as easy. Well, I, don't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't interested. You weren't looking at that, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think at this point, yes. we should... Prepare to the bar and refresh our glasses. And before that, thank the speaker for a very entertaining and very good. diversionary, diverting talk. <laughs> <laughs>